Goliath of Gath with his helmet of brass. Anyone know that? Was seated one day upon the green grass. When up, up, up stepped young David, a servant of Saul, and said, I will smite thee, although I am so small. Try singing that if you've got a lisp. We're talking about the gifts of the Spirit. I've been doing a little series. And uh, they're found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What are the gifts of the Spirit? Well, they're charismatic gifts. Gifts of charisma. Gifts of grace, in other words. And uh, my definition is that they're a free manifestation of the Holy Spirit, working in and through you, but going beyond a believer's natural abilities. They're supernatural, not natural. In other words, you may have uh, musical talent, <coughs> but that's not a gift of the Spirit. The Spirit will use it, but the gifts of the Spirit are supernatural. And so we've been looking at those. Why do we have them? To equip the church in declaring Christ. Who can receive them? The Bible says, e to each person grace is given. This is just a little uh, resume. Now, I divided the gifts up into three groups of three because there's nine of them and the first one are the gifts of revelation we dealt with the word of wisdom the word of knowledge <coughs> discerning of spirits then we talked about the gifts of power which are faith the gift of healing miracles and the one I want to deal with today are called the gifts of utterance or the vocal gifts and they include prophecy tongues and interpretation of tongues now, we're going to look at these, uh, <coughs> to go through these. Now, I'd just like to say that these three that I'm going to talk about are the most difficult to talk about. Um, well, the reason is because tongues is a controversial thing in some people's minds. Some people feel that if they don't pray in tongues, that they're being criticised. But I have to say, in all my years of being a charismatic, I've never ever heard anyone say, I speak in tongues and therefore am superior to you. I've never heard it. But it's something that's often levelled at people. And that makes it very difficult because people are looking at this from a wounded position. Some people feel second class citizens. That's not the case. That's never the case. Um, there are some people that we would call cessationists that are people who don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. They say that we don't need them anymore because we have the Bible. So therefore we don't need these things. But really, no cessationist would say, look, we don't need knowledge when God gives us knowledge of a situation or wisdom or that God has stopped doing miracles or healing people. Yet they claim we don't need tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy. It doesn't really make sense we all know times when God speaks to us in our spirit and brings the Bible to life for us in a particular way. It's called the Rema word, when God speaks to, to you specifically. Jesus talked about it when he was being tempted. He said that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that word is the Rema, the specific word that God speaks to you and to me that I live by. When God speaks to me, I come alive. You with me? Yeah. Okay, good. So we're going to look at these. Um, there is another problem that, uh, that comes with tongues, is that there is something, a teaching called initial evidence, which says if you have been baptised in the Spirit, you must speak in tongues. Now, people are divided on, on that. Um, for me, it is a sign of the baptism of the Spirit, but it's not the only sign. But it's one that's the most prevalent in the Scripture, so we have to accept that for what it is. Now, <clears throat> I want to just run through these very briefly. The gifts of the Spirit are not very hard to understand, to be truthful. But with tongues, I want to talk about the gift of tongues. Where people go wrong is often not realising that when Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians 14, he's writing about two sorts of tongues. Private use and public use. Let me put it like that. And if you don't get that right, then you read it and you don't understand it. 
we're dealing with the public use of someone speaking in tongues. If you don't know what I mean, it means the ability to speak in a foreign language that's not been taught to you as the Spirit himself gives utterance. It's not normally a language that we understand or know. It's something supernatural. But when someone speaks in tongues, you know it. Now, tongues are not a status symbol. I want to say that. But if you get mixed up between private and public tongues, and we're going to do a little Bible study in a moment, you'll see what I mean. You'll, you'll not understand what Paul's writing about. But in chapter 14, he talks about the correct use of public tongues. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Uh, the private use of tongues is a gift that I think that everyone can have, frankly. Um, it's not a sign of maturity. It's just a sign that God's working and there's much fear and ignorance about it. But a tongue that's given out in a meeting for interpretation is what I'm talking about. Interpretation of tongues is that someone supernaturally tells us what the tongue has just said. It's an interpretation. It's not a word-for-word -word translation. I've had someone said to me, I counted up 42 words in that tongue and there were 43 in the interpretation. They haven't understood. It's an interpretation. It's not a translation. <coughs> and that's very important. And again, it's public tongues we're talking about when someone's doing that. Now, Tongues and interpretation of tongues equal prophecy. They're the same thing in the scripture. Now prophecy is someone speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it's done for three things, for exhortation, edification and comfort. I'm coming back to all of these things. Must be judged and done under authority. You see, we have a tendency to get things wrong. In Acts chapter 21, if you've got your Bibles, you should look at some of these. In Acts chapter 21, you've got a situation that has developed. Acts chapter 20 is a lovely chapter. I know I'm talking about 21, but Paul spends some time with the elders of Ephesus and he pours out his heart and you can see his heart of love and grace and everything there. And after he'd finished that, it says in verse 1, when they departed from him and set sail, he ran a straight course to Cos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. So this is Luke writing. He's with this group of people. <coughs> when we came inside of Cyprus, we said we'll pop in there and have a kebab. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria, landed at Tyre, and from there the ship was to unload its car cargo. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days. They kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. Did you notice that? Through the Spirit, they were saying, don't set foot in Jerusalem. When our days were ended, <coughs> we left and started on our journey. And while they all with wives and children escorted us until we were out of the city, after kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another then we went on board the ship and they returned home again. When they'd finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais. And after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea. And entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, remember Philip is the one who went down to Samaria and saw miracles, <coughs> who, was one, sorry, <coughs> who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. Now where did they prophesy? Anyone want to volunteer? Where did they prophesy? He's got four daughters, they're all prophetesses. Where did they prophesy? In the church, yeah, exactly, in the church. So when you're reading the scripture that says, I don't permit women to speak in church, you've got to balance it up against this. That perhaps Paul is not talking about a blanket ban on all women, that shouldn't speak in church. In fact, far from it, because he approved of it. Do you understand that? It's very important to balance scripture with scripture. We went on a conference many, many years ago, and we, ar we arrived at this place and found there was another group having a conference at the same time. 
And come the Sunday, we said to them, look, why don't we just all join together, all your folk and our folk, and we'll come together and we'll break bread together and it'd be great to have fellowship with you. We didn't know them, we'd never met them. And they said to us, we have traditions. So me being what I, the usual mug, put my foot in it, what's your traditions? We don't allow our women to speak. So we had to come to a compromise with that situation. But they, they had a tradition. What would they do with this verse? What do they do with it? Ignore it. Pretend it's not there. <coughs> or perhaps the prophetesses. What happened? They had a prophecy and they run out there, put their hand over their mouth till they got outside and then prophesied. No, it's ludicrous. But look out for those little things. They make a difference. We were staying there for some days and a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Now he appears in the book of Acts several times. Coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. <clears throat> in this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. Now, they took on themselves an interpretation that was not a, a biblical one. They said, Paul, it says that you're going to get in trouble when you go to Jerusalem. Don't go, don't go. But Paul said, hold on. God's already spoken to me. All this is doing is warning me of what's to come. All of that is warning me. And I'll tell you where you'll find that. If you go back to that chapter 20, in verse 23, 22. Now behold, this is Paul talking to the uh, Ephesian elders. Now behold, bound by the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, this is by prophecy, saying that bonds and affliction await me. This prophecy was given not to stop Paul going, but to warn him of what would happen. So when it did happen, he knew God is at work still. Despite this, God's at work. You see, we need to judge prophecy and get it right. It's a very important thing. So we'll, we'll do that. Now, I'd like to do a little Bible study. And it's 1 Corinthians 14, if you turn to that. And I'm going to run through a number of verses. We'll do it fast. Okay? So we're dealing with tongues. There's a gift of the Spirit, a tool that's God-given for the spread of the gospel. Two sorts of tongues, don't, don't forget. And he's talking about bringing a tongue in a meeting for general blessing, not individual prayer, but for everyone. He makes plain in chapter 12 that God is sovereign in these things. But let's just start from verse 1. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, that especially that you may prophesy. And I want to say this, if you follow after love, you'll end up in the gifts of the Spirit. That's what Paul says. Okay? Verse 2, for one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands that in his spirit he speaks mysteries. So tongues appear to be spirit to spirit. That's what's happening when you're praying in tongues on your own. But when it's done in the meeting and there's an interpretation, mysteries are revealed. The word mysteries in the New Testament means things that will be revealed, not hidden things but things that have been hidden but are going to be revealed. Verse 3 defines them, but one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, that means building up, exhortation and consolation. Okay, that defines what prophecy should be. Verse 4, one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. So Paul's interested in the church being built up. That's what he's talking about. Tongues edify, they build you up. So 
when when someone I, I heard someone say, I, I don't want to be in a, a church where they just babble away. That's someone who doesn't understand what tongues is about. Tongues edifies you, builds you up. If you're a, this is about personal prayer. If you're in personal prayer and you don't know how to pray for something, pray in tongues. The spirit, your spirit knows what to pray. The spirit of God knows what needs to happen. God's at work there. Um, but tongues uh, edifies, but really we want it to be something that builds up the church. So verse 5. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues but even more that you prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edifying. You see what Paul's saying? I want the church to be built up. And that's how it works in these things. As far as I'm concerned, he says, I'd like you all to pray in tongues. If you don't pray in tongues, we'll pray with you after, if you want, want to do that, because it edifies you and it builds you up. And I'm with Paul. I wish that they all spoke with tongues. But in the church, we want to do it for edifying. Verse 6. Well, actually, 6 to 12, I'm just going to read. The summary of that is this. Speak that which can be understood in meetings. All right? That's what he's saying. But let's just read it. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what's played on the flute or on the harp? That's my musicianship there. Uh, for if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So also, unless you utter by the tongue speech that's clear, how will it be known what's spoken? For you'll be speaking into the air. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I don't know the meaning of the language, I will be to one who speaks a barbarian. Who's having the name barbarian? No one's caught on. That's where the word Barbara comes from. Never mind. <laughs> and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. <clears throat> now, how do I do that? Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Do you ever pray that you may interpret tongues? Have you ever sat here in a meeting, heard someone bring a tongue? We don't do it very often. We need to change that. I believe that God wants to do that. But pray that you may interpret. How's it going to happen otherwise? Some people think that the Holy Spirit, when he comes on someone there, it's like, I don't know, oil pouring out of heaven or something. It's not that. It's that little inner voice that says, this is me speaking. This is me working. This is how all the gifts work. That little inner voice that says, this is me at work. And we need to heed it. And we've forgotten how to do that in, in meetings. So pray that you may inter interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. So there's nothing wrong with tongues, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, I will pray with the mind also. I'll sing with the spirit, I'll sing with the mind also. Do you ever sing in the spirit? I do a lot. When, I, when I'm on my own, I'll sing in tongues. In the car, I sing in tongues. I try to keep the window down, especially at traffic lights. But if you sing in tongues, sometimes you'll find that well, how can I put it? Some, there are blackbirds out there and there are crows. And some of us feel that we're more crow than blackbird. But really, when you start to sing in tongues, you'll be amazed how you find a song, a tune, that there's a harmony. I've seen people absolutely uh, amazed at the harmonies that have gone on when people are singing in tongues. We should do some of that in the worship. That's important. Otherwise, if you bless in the Spirit, how will one who fills the place of the ungifted say the Amen and you're giving of thanks since he does not know what you're saying? You see what Paul's saying all the time? Pray in tongues, that's great. But pray that you may interpret. Then everyone gets the benefit. 
Is this coming over? Could you say that a bit louder? Yes. yes, thank you. Okay. So private tongues blesses. You're giving thanks, but instruction comes from understanding what's spoken. Now verse 20, um, or verse 19, However, in the church I desire to speak five words with my mind that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. He's not saying don't pray in tongues, but he's saying pray for an interpretation and let God speak through that. Now, the next passage, uh, verse 20 says that we have to be mature in our thinking, but verses 21 through to about um, 24 and 25 are a bit controversial because some people say this. They say that a scribe who is writing this down somewhere got it back to front. Because if you read it, uh, we better do that. In the law it's written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people. Even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then tongues are for a sign, not to those that believe, but to unbelievers. Okay? But prophecy is for a sign not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. That's straightforward, I understand. Therefore, if the whole church assembled together and all speak in tongues and ungifted or unbelievers enter, will they not say you're mad? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he's convicted by all, he's called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. Did you notice that what they're saying is the reverse? Paul says one, one thing at first, and then he says the opposite. So people have said, well, this must be because someone who was taking it down got it wrong. Well, I have difficulty with that. I have difficulty saying that the scripture is wrong, and it can be changed by a scribe getting it mixed up here. But um, the answer is found at Pentecost. Isn't that what happened? Unbelievers thought they were mad. They didn't believe, but although it was a sign for them. Now, what I've done is I've done the cheek of rewriting those verses. Okay? So this is what I think it says, to put it a little plainer. In the law it's written, by men of strange tongues and by lips of strangers, I will speak to this people, yet they still won't listen to me. That's a direct quote from Isaiah 28. All right? So that's clear. Just then, just like Pentecost, I gave tongues as a sign, not for the believers, they already know me, but as a sign to those unbelievers that I was at work. But they still laughed and accused you of being drunk. Okay? Instead, I give prophecy as a sign to believers for their blessing. Nevertheless, sometimes unbelievers are present and hear it, and it exposes their own hearts. I've seen that here. When someone said that prophecy, how did you know? I don't know what you're talking about. How did you know what you spoke about? You see, I, I believe that sometimes when I'm preaching, it's prophetic. And people say to me, they have literally said to me, how did you know that? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. But you just said what was on my heart and what God had been speaking to me or that I'm struggling with. It's God at work. And that he works with prophecy. Prophecy is to build you and I up. But there's an overflow. God's a great economist. There's an overflow and it reaches to the hearts of people that are sometimes total unbelievers. That's what it's saying. So when you come together and pray in tongues, pray privately, not publicly, unless there's an interpretation you'll know the difference. Otherwise, unbelievers of, or people with no understanding will think you're mad, just like the heathen who are possessed. You see, there were groups of people in this day and age who would pray in tongues that had nothing to do with Christianity. They did it through evil spirits, through wrong spirits. And they were generally regarded as rather strange uh, there are still groups like that around today. Otherwise, unbelievers or people with no understanding will think you're mad, just like the heathen who are possessed. 
But if someone interprets, it becomes prophecy. And these same people, unbelievers, may have the secrets of their heart made plain and they will declare that God is in you. Does that make it any clearer to you or not? Shall I read it again? In the law it's written by men of strange tongues and by lips of strangers. I will speak to this people, but yet they still won't listen to me. That's what God said. Then just like Pentecost, I gave tongues as a sign, not for the believers. They already know me, but as a sign to those unbelievers that I was at work. But they still laughed and accused you of being drunk. Instead, I give prophecy as a sign to believers for their blessing. Nevertheless, sometimes unbelievers are present and hear it and it exposes their own heart. So when you get together and you pray in tongues, pray privately, that's, that's there, not publicly, unless there's an interpretation. You'll know the difference. Have you ever thought when you're praying, this is for more than me? That's how you bring a tongue. You bring a tongue and that's how it works. Someone will interpret. Otherwise, unbelievers or people with no understanding will think you're mad, just like the heathen who are possessed. But if someone interprets, it becomes prophecy. And these same people, unbelievers, may have the secrets of their heart made plain and they will declare that God is in you. So how do we run a meeting? Verse 26 says this. What's the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. We should be sharing more what God's doing in our midst. You know, if you feel that God's put something in your heart, share it. Share it with people because it's the word of God to people. And that's how we should have a meeting. Yeah, we have preaching. Yes, we have worship. But we should have time when you can bring what God has spoken to you during the meeting. I've told this before, and please forgive me for saying it again, but it's so apt. I went to a meeting in South London, and there was a group of Christians uh, all together worshipping and praising. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, prophesy this, that you're divided down the middle. You need to get your life sorted out. You need to deal with these things. And I sat there and I looked around and I said, these people are saints. I can't bring that. That's not you, Lord. And the minute I said that, someone on the other side of the room said, the Lord says, you're divided down the middle. Exactly what God had given to me. And I was ashamed. I said to the Lord, I'm so sorry. I missed what you said or I didn't believe. God knows what he's doing. But had, if that word was genuine, which it was, it had the effect of uniting this church, dealing with issues. God wants to speak to us. You may feel in your heart, well, I just feel a strong that there's someone here who's got such and such a problem or they're going to the, the mill. You stand up and you say, this is what's happening. It makes all the world of difference to them. They've heard from God and they know what God wants to do. So we need to do that. Everyone, it says, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Now, the next bit confuses people. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or three at the most, and each in turn, and one must interpret. When I first got filled with the Spirit, we would meet together. I don't know where it came from. There was a teaching that you couldn't have more than three tongues in a meeting based on this verse that's not the case it says that if you have a tongue and you have a tongue and you have a tongue stop there and we'll bring the interpretation and the same thing if prophets it says if there's no interpreter keep silent in the church let him speak to himself and to God but the only way we're going to find out is when people start bringing tongues and people are going to say I think I've got the interpretation that's the only way let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment so bring that, bring a prophetic word. Two or three, then stop and say, what are you saying, Lord, in, in this? Uh, if a revelation is made to another who's seated, the first must keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one. So we're going to start at the back, going all right, with Gordon first and then all the way around. We can all prophesy one by one so that you may all learn and may all be exalted. Uh, exalted and the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets for God is not a God of confusion but of peace 
as in all the churches. Now, verse 32 is very important. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. I've heard various things. I've heard people who like to swoon before they prophesy. I've had people speak in strange voices. They suddenly, they're normal. And they, they said, that's said the Lord. <laughs> they, what? I've had Shakespeare in English. That's another one. People love that. Thus saith the Lord who giveth thee blessings. And the, the funny one that we once heard was, which I've said here before, the man who prophesied, the Lord says, kiddeth not thyself. <laughs> I don't think Shakespeare ever used that one. But you don't need to be different. No strange pronouncements. And nobody can say the Spirit made me do it. That's what Paul comes along. He says, we work in harmony and cooperation with the Holy Spirit. It's never the Spirit made me do it. So if I'm in the middle of preaching and you stand up and bring a prophecy, I'll say to you, stop and wait until the end. And if you say, well, I, I've got to do it because the Spirit's made me do it, it's not the Spirit. All right? These are rules that Paul laid down for sensible meetings, hearing from God in all these kinds of things. The question comes, how do we receive the gifts? Well, one of the ways that it's clear is by laying on of hands, isn't it? That happens, I could quote you a couple of scriptures I wrote down before I did it. In Acts, Paul, in Acts 19, Paul goes to Ephesus, finds a group of people, says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we've never heard of this Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? So they said, what were you baptised into? And they said, well, John the Baptist's baptism. And they said, John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus, but Jesus has come now. So they said, well, we want to be baptised in the name of Jesus. They were baptised, and he laid his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them. All right? So that's one of the, one of the ways. Same thing happened with Philip down in Samaria, when there was all kinds of things happened. They laid hands on them. And they receive the gifts of the Spirit. They receive the Spirit and the gifts. The Bible says that we're to stir up the gift, but it does rather imply that you have the gift. But Paul wrote to Timothy twice, stir it up, stir it up. Smith Wigglesworth used to say, if the Spirit doesn't stir me, I stir the Spirit. If the Spirit doesn't spur, stir me, I stir the Spirit. You may think that's very presumptuous. God loves presumptuous people. He loves the people that presume that he loves them and has grace towards them and will give them the things that, that they want because he loves. So you can be presumptuous. So stir up the gift. We could stir up the gift in a moment. We'll have a moment's prayer. But if you want prayer, we'll pray for you at the end of the meeting. Come out at the end and we'll pray. But let me tell you this, that God, that tongues is such a blessing, private, but we want it to be public in the meetings and we want it done correctly and we've got the uh, everything here prophecy is a wonderful thing you see when Paul got to Jerusalem it happened just as, it, as they said they arrested him, they bound him and he didn't say Lord what are you doing have I gone wrong somewhere he said Lord thank you that you told me this was going to happen and you told by that little housewife that was in the church at Ephesus and, Ephesus and that man in Corinth who brought that word of encouragement to my heart and this other person who did that. You're the person to bring God's word. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God can do that in you? Yeah. Okay, let's just have a moment's prayer. And in our prayer, why don't you ask the Lord for a chance to prophesy, if not today, tomorrow, the next day, for a chance to bring a word, even a tongue. Why don't you ask the Lord for that and believe him for it? Because God wants to give those things. He loves to give those things. I wanted to finish on saying this. Be aware of the gifts. Have expectation that God will give them. Realise that faith is a requirement to use them. Seek them by love. Expect them because of love. And exercise them in love.
all right be aware of them have expectation that god will give them realize that faith is a requirement to use them seek them by love expect them because of love exercise them in love let's just pray father we want to give you a chance to speak to us and teach us your ways lord you know we've somehow forgotten some of these things and we want to rebuild them into our lives and into our meetings that you should have freedom to speak your word to all of our hearts lord we open our hearts to you now lord and ask that you'll touch us those of us that already use the gifts lord we pray that you'll teach us more for those that have never exercised the gifts lord start the process today let's just pray go on you seek the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Sabala no shola la sabala no no solo no siya da da seya. Peshela da ba no no solo no suri da da seya. Fiesela da mo no shola no suya da da seya.